Anyway, this morning what I wanted to do was just continue to share on the supernatural church. This is not something that we should ever get tired of. I think this is something that we continue to press into. Uh, this is something that we need to be leaning into. So as far as our theology goes, as far as our practical theology goes, and our practical experience, we need to be muscling up on this whole thing that God wants the church to be. He wants us to be familiar, not in the sense that familiarity breeds contempt, and I know that can happen when people get too familiar with the presence of God and they begin to play the fool with it. Now, I'm not suggesting that at all. God's presence is not to be played with, but rather let's just value the power dynamic that God has put into the life of the church. And so the church is just not a gathering of religious people who have a particular religious persuasion. On the contrary, the church is central to what God is doing in the world. And I love what Eugene Peterson says, the world is actually peripheral to the church. It's not the other way around. In other words, actually, you and I have a part to play. We have a relevance in our nation right now with finances being what they are, with uh, sickness uh, as a result of, of COVID being what it is, with the political upheaval being what it is, you and I have a relevance. And our relevance isn't to run out with placards and protest. Okay, no, no, no. We take our protest to the prayer closet. You've heard me preach that before. That's where we find our place of relevance as the church. That's where we find our ability to stand in the gap and to simply intercede and to pray for our nation. Like never before, we need to be having more prayer vigils. And so I feel like I state the obvious, because you sitting there are saying, absolutely, yes, 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 we do need to do that. And so as far as New Covenant Church Bryanston goes, well, we've just had a fast. We've just had a vigil where we took time out, and we literally came to God with the dynamics that we did in terms of just the direction that we had, because we know... And we know that actually that's the only solution for this nation. The nation doesn't need a political solution. It needs the Christians to stand up and to pray that unrighteousness would fall. Yeah. And that in fact we would have righteous leadership. That is a very redemptive prayer to pray. So we're not praying judgment. We're simply saying let righteousness fall. God's the judge. But you and I stand in the gap where we pray and where we pray the word of God, the angels who are ministering spirits. Okay, in other words, what is a ministering spirit? It's a servant to those who are redeemed, to those who are saints. That's you and I. And so when we speak the word, what happens is they hear the word of God and they respond to the word of God. That's what angels do. And so for me, it's absolutely vital that we understand the part that we play in our nation right now. It's easy to criticize our president. Very easy. But let's be praying for him. Let's be praying that there is something of a heart change in that man. Let's be praying. When you look at the administration of certain things in our nation, it's very easy to criticize it and to say, well, let's protest about it. No, no, no. We take our protest to the place of prayer. Christians, that's where our power is. That's where we find our relevance in God. And so what I'm wanting to do this morning is to talk specifically around forgotten or the ignored warfare realities. The ignored warfare realities. We've forgotten these things. And obviously I'm going to be talking about warring in the heavenlies. Now, in a world that is predominantly leaning towards a Marxist way of thinking. I remember Karl Marx was, a, was an atheist. Okay? And uh, his particular philosophy resulted in millions of people dying. And so it's not a philosophy that in any way represents heaven whatsoever. And so what we need to be doing is we've got to pray the right. We can't see South Africa through a political lens. We've got to see South Africa through a Christian worldview. And so how we bring that about is by you and I getting into that closet and praying. And so we're going to look at one man. Actually, we're going to look at three individuals. We're going to look at Daniel, first of all. And we're going to see what Daniel did. And so Daniel has this prayer vigil. It's fascinating. He prays. I mean, you've got Israel, God's people that are under, they kind of under Babylonian captivity. And so what he does is he finds a place where he can pray. And it says in Daniel chapter 10, it says, During those days, I, Daniel, went into mourning over Jerusalem for three weeks, 21 days. Now he's into the space of prayer and fasting because it basically tells you what his diet consisted of as well in this fast that he had. It was a partial fast. It wasn't a water fast. And then what happens is it says this. It says, um, <clears throat> relax, Daniel. 
there's an angel that appears. This heavenly being comes and he says, don't be afraid. For from the moment you decided to humble yourself to receive understanding, your prayer was heard and I set out to come to you. So you've got one man praying. This is not a combination of people praying. While you do get that in the scriptures. And the New Testament is a wonderful place for us to look and see how there was the rallying together of the church. In fact, the very first prayer vigil. What is a prayer vigil? It's just a season where there is a call to prayer. And it's normally in a place, time of crisis, such as what we're experiencing right now. And so that's what our fasting and our prayer was in recent days, was simply a prayer vigil. And so the first prayer vigil, interestingly enough, is the disciples, where Jesus says, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and there I want you to pray. And so 120 of them gather together, and they pray. And what are they praying for? They're just praying for the promise that Jesus said they were to inherit. They had no clue. He told them it was the Holy Spirit, and he said, I'm sending you a comfort. I'm not sending you a cheap replacement. I'm sending you the same as. Remember I preached that? I'm sending someone exactly like me. And so when the Holy Spirit came, it was in response to their praying. And of course, from then on, the rest is history because we see the supernatural church, the Holy Spirit empowering them and moving into all of what it is that you read about in the book of Acts. And oh my goodness, there was much reason for them to go and protest because the Christian church was persecuted. And so you have the leaders and you have just Christians being killed by religious people. Pharisees were killing Christians. How do I know that? Because Paul was a Pharisee. And he describes, he says, man, I was the worst sinner. And of course, you know his testimony. He was a murderer. He was going out killing Christians. And they could have run into the streets and protested and just said, oh, we're victims, we're victims. But they didn't often. How often it is that you find them in a place of prayer. And when the church prayed, what is it? The place was shaken. And that's what we need. We need the place to be shaken. We need a revival church. We don't necessarily only need a political adjustment in our land. The political adjustment is going to come when the church stands in its rightful place of relevance and begins to pray in harmony. And we have these prayer seasons. We have these prayer moments. That's when we begin to see change. And so... In Daniel chapter 10, there are things that we can take out of this because you've got this incredible spirit being, this angel (laughs) that responds to one man's prayer. In fact, not only does heaven respond, the whole demonic realm responds as well. And they go and they resist the answer. They resist this angel. Because let me read a little further. And it says, the reason why I didn't arrive when you started to pray, remember the response is immediate. It says, um, but I was waylaid by the angel prince, angel prince, another supernatural being of the kingdom of Persia. He wasn't speaking about a human personality. The Bible talks here about this is a spiritual um, individual that is in a position of authority over a nation. And it says this. (laughs) He says, and I was delayed for a good three weeks. But now look at this. But then Michael, one of the chief angel princes intervened to help me but i left him there with the prince of the kingdom of persia so clearly there was massive conflict let's just call it a battle going on and now i'm here to help you and understand what will eventually happen to your people the vision has to do with what is ahead and so god clearly is wanting to reveal to daniel and also to us who are generations to come later what he has in mind for the world and so the world's history is all leading towards the climax of the ages when Jesus returns and takes his bride. Now we're on that journey, but in this life we're going to have trials. And in this life we're going to have tribulations. And so when we have the trials and the tribulations, what are we getting? We're getting counsel and advice about what to do. And so when we look behind what's happening in our nation, when you look behind what's happening with COVID, who's the influencer? Who's the one that drives COVID-19? Who's the one that influences the injustices? And, you know, the songs that are being sung around certain parts of our country right now are not songs of peace and love. On the contrary, they're songs that are not inspired in heaven. They're songs about revolution. They're songs about about bloodshed. They're songs about racial hatred. Now, who's inspiring that? Political individuals? Well, what I find interesting is that actually this particular text tells us that one man in his prayer begins to activate the heavenlies. And you get a response from heaven immediately, but immediately get a response from the demonic realm where these princes. And so there's a prince over South Africa. 
Let me say this, there's a prince over Africa. And so what you have to do is you just got to look at the fruit. And so there has to be a seed for there to be a fruit. And so the seeds have been planted. And when you have violent discrimination, when you have hatred for one another, well, that's an atmosphere that the seed of bloodshed grows in. And so what we're looking at is who's watering that seed? It's the spirit. It's the prince of South Africa. And I say this with confidence because we need to understand as a supernatural church what it is that we're dealing with. There are spiritual forces in high places. And I'm going to read you a text in a moment that wasn't just because of Paul's poetic ability that he was going to write Ephesians 6 and tell us about we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, this is what we're reading about. And so it's consistent with the Bible when we look at Daniel. Daniel, this man, one man, activates so much. The text allows us to understand the demonic realm over nations and the personality, the ruling spirits, and described as princes and kings. So what's true for our nation, church? Let me tell you, going outside and criticizing the president and criticizing all of the individuals by their name is not going to help. What we need to be doing is we don't go out with our placards. We go into that prayer vigil. We go into that place where our hearts are united and we begin to declare God's wisdom. We begin to declare God's purposes for South Africa. And we know it's not bloodshed. And we know it's not bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness. We know it's not that. And so when the church rises up and simply stands together, then the place will be shaken. And yes, evil will fall out. But as a church, that's where our hope is. You know, some eight years ago, and I do, I, I do recall sharing this with you when it happened. But eight years, there's a lot of life in the church. Not that there wasn't then, but I'm just saying a lot of new people have come in. I remember one morning, and most of my prayer time is early morning. I was out in my garden, and I was just praying. I was, I'd found myself in a situation where I was just asking God, God, what is my relevance to the body of Christ? I know that I have certain gifts. But what is my relevance? Will I always be doing what I'm doing now? In other words, leading a team that leads a wonderful campus. And I felt in that moment, God say to me, in the place that you're right now, you feel sonship. And that's true. When I pray, I'm praying, my father, I'm a son. I'm connecting. I feel sonship. And I also feel, well done, my beloved son. That, that's what I'm feeling when I'm praying. And so I felt God say to me that in the place of prayer, you will, for the rest of your life, always have relevance to the body of Christ and to the world that you're living in. In that moment, can I say, I was just like converted in my heart to know that actually this is the right thing to do, is to pray and to separate myself to God. Even if it might seem like it's awkward, the hours, I mean, what time are you praying? You know what? Sacrifice sacrifice because prayer is hard it's easy to simply paint a nice little placard and garden on the street that's the easy thing to gather together to pray people that's the challenge because it requires sacrifice but let me tell you it's when there is a pure sacrifice the fire from heaven falls you're not gonna get fire if you don't have sacrifice and so god's calling us as individuals you see this is an individual thing most of you live your life in an individual way you don't always have groups of people around about you and so for me, there needs to be a conversion in our hearts towards being a people that will pray. And we will pray. And I'm going to, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to tell us what to pray. In other words, things that I have used as I believe are weapons that I take into my prayer time, praying against COVID, praying against political upheaval and ha racial hatred. I pray into those things and I use scriptures. Anyway, let me carry on. And so what we were able to see is that human rulers and human commanders don't operate in a vacuum on their own. Behind them are unseen angelic forces. But in this particular situation, nothing happened until one man, Daniel, prayed. Frankly, I don't know of any scripture that doesn't challenge us, challenge us more to pray. There's a revelation here, especially today. And so I'm encouraging you. What's the next? I want to talk about Paul. You know, Paul is this incredible individual who... You know, I remember the sons of Sceva. You know, they were trying to cast out demons. <laughs> the person who was demon-possessed, I mean, simply responded and said, well, you know, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? 
So it's an incredible thing when Paul had a reputation in hell. And so he understood this whole realm of the demonic. And so he understood Daniel. I mean, he was a Pharisee. He'd been trained under Gamaliel. And I mean, who had been given, who's credited as being a, a scholar of, of high worthiness, if there's such a term. And yet that's who Paul was instructed by. And so they would, have, they would have known the content of Daniel. They would have known chapter 10 of Daniel and chapter 12 of Daniel when you read about Michael, this archangel that comes in and simply says, okay, you leave this, this spirit to me. You go and you serve what it is that Daniel has been praying for. Paul says this. I love this. He speaks specifically about us being strong in the Lord. How are we being strong in the Lord? You're not being strong in the Lord by protesting. You take your protest into the prayer closet. It says, be empowered through your union with Him. That's where our power comes, people. And it says, um, draw your strength from Him. That strength which is boundless might provides. In His boundless might provides. Now, I'm reading here out of the Amplified because I love the amplification of this particular truth. It says, put on the whole armor, the armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to stand against or up against all the strategies and the deceits of the devil. Uh, you know, in my military background, there was a thing that we needed desperately. We needed military intelligence. And what effectively is military intelligence? And because my training was very British, I was an engineer, a sapper, as we were known. Um, we were told that we needed to get direction, in other words, have a plan. We were told we needed to collect and gather as much information as we needed. We were then to process that information, which required study and analysis, and then there was dissemination of that information. In other words, that would then go to our troops, and we would know exactly where the opposition, where the enemy lines were. And so it's, we're in a spiritual war. That means simply... That if we have direction, which is to bring peace, is to see COVID-19 fall to its knees in the name of Jesus, by the power of the name of Jesus. But the church, we shouldn't be asking, why is this happening? No, what is the response in our heart towards it? It's so that we can get closer to God, so that we can kiss the Son, so we can have that moment of embracing Him. This is what the world is so telling us, desperate. So the church needs to bow its knee and to bow its heart in humble reverence to prayer and to God. And so the reason why I say that thing about intelligence is because actually when I read the scriptures, I just feel God saying, well, this is what I, you need to know for the war that you're fighting. First of all, the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Who's the thief? It's the enemy. He's the one that wants to see us. You know, Jesus, when he said, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he gives us, that's actually a weapon. It's God's covenantal heart to you and I as believers coming through this prayer. And so when we pray it as an individual, when we pray it in unison, it's power. And so when I look at this, I just see God simply saying, well, you need this. This is part of your armory. This is the kind of weapons that you need to go into the fight that you're in. And so for us as believers, we need to come into that place where we see it for what it is. Who's the God of this world? In the wilderness. Satan says to Jesus, all this I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. Well, if it wasn't his to give, <laughs> why did he say that? Because it was his to give. And so if the God of this world is Satan, can you see why we've got such rubbish word carefully selected happening in our environment right now? And so what we need to do is not accept that. Don't tell me the devil's more powerful than the church. Don't tell me the devil's more powerful than your prayer. We've got one man, Daniel, who prays and there's just action. And so let's have a look at what Paul says. Paul writes and he says, put on the whole armor. He says, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotism, against powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural realm. Well, where have we read that before? We've read it in Daniel, the text that I just read to you. It shows you that there are spiritual beings that are trying to bring South Africa to its knees. And you and I as a church can put up a stop sign and simply say, the stop sign reads, in the name of Jesus, you bow the knee. Please say amen to that. 
that and let's embrace the truth that we've seen. That's how we fight COVID-19. That's how we stand up against the political injustices that we might see around us. That's how we stand up against racial hatred. Church, what? sorry, I'm passionate about this because we're in a war. And I love this church. And I have to share the truth with you. I can't be neutral. I can't borrow ideas from the world. I do not see South Africa through a political lens. I through, see it through what I read in the scriptures. And I'm going to lead the church the way I see things in the scriptures. That's my mandate. And so we were recently in Egypt having to quarantine before we came through to Dubai. And uh, the hotel that we were staying in was kind of on an island in the middle of the Nile. Now, for those of you who've never seen the Nile, the Nile is not some little Yuxke River. <laughs> the Nile is a massive, massive river. I've seen most of the big rivers in Africa. And uh, I have to say the Nile compares. Eh? It really does. I mean, the stretch that we were in, the Nile was easily 200 meters across. I mean, that's pretty big, pretty broad. And it flows all the time. But I couldn't help following my heart and saying, oh, this is a great time for me to go and do some meditation in Exodus. And so what I'm wanting to do is just conclude with some of the thoughts. And I'm wanting to raise this next week and the week thereafter. I'm wanting you to see that when you start to fight with God, you are in serious trouble. And so when COVID tries to close the church, as it has done up to now, and when we've got political upheaval and there's people that are determined to see bloodshed in our nation, I tell you what, this is what we need to be praying. We need to be taking things. You don't fight with God. You don't mess with God. And here we have it. Pharaoh, he tried to do that. And this is what Moses, so I'm going to really summarize this quickly. Moses and God are interacting. And God says, I've seen the crowd, my people. And God looks at South Africa and he says, I've seen the crowd, my people. God looks at New Covenant Church, Bryanston, and he says, I see the crowd, my people. And everyone under the sound of my voice right now, God says, I've seen your heart. I've seen the cry. You've lost someone. You're without a job. You're struggling. I've seen the cry of your, of your heart. And he says, but this, this thing you need to know, Moses I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go. God's foreknowledge. He's not going to let you go. Well, then why are you sending me, God? Well, because I know that he is a stubborn man. He's got a character that is stubborn. He's got a history that is stubborn. And the only way that he's going to let you go, if it's by force. And God's simply saying, that's going to suit me. Because the more stubborn he is, I'm actually going to use his stubborn heart. Stubborn heart was already there. All right, in that first, first interaction, he says, I know he won't let you go, All right, unless he's forced to. So I'm going to use his stubborn heart, and I'm going to show my glory. So in, in equal proportions, he resists, he pushes back, he pushes back, just like COVID is pushing back, and it comes up with a variant virus, a mutation, or whatever you want to call it. And just like you've got some political figures that are wanting bloodshed, and they're wanting more fame for themselves than for the people of the nation. You know, they push back, the whole time push back on God's view, on God's reason for South Africa. God's purpose is for South Africa. It's not poverty. It's not war. It's not at all. No. And so what happens is you've got this, you've got this, you've got this hard heart. And then God says, well, I'm going to use that hard heart. And so every time there was a plague, you know, when the River Nile turned into blood. I mean, I stared at that River Nile and I thought, this is ridiculous. This whole river turned into blood. I think when you're there, suddenly the penny drops and you see the power of God's judgment. The frogs, the lice, <laughs> the wild animals and the pestilence and the, the boils, the thunderstorm of hail, the locusts, darkness for three days and then the death of the firstborn. Man, I want to tell you that it wreaked havoc in Egypt. So by the time the people of God left, they had a testimony of this is a man who tried to fight with God and look what happened to him. God used his stubborn heart. And simply says, well, you want to be stubborn here? I'm actually going to make it harder. Because you love just being stubborn. And every time there was a, a plague, the Bible says God hardened his heart. But he hardened what was already there. Interesting, isn't it? And so what you have is you've got the people being released. They're coming out of slavery. They're coming out of bondage. They're coming out of a place where their hearts cry was, God, liberate us. And that's our hearts cry. God, liberate us from COVID. Liberate us from a government that actually just wants to see bloodshed. So it happens. Now, of course, they um, on the banks of the Red Sea and on the horizon is just dust. Here comes Pharaoh. He is unhappy. 
And so uh, he hasn't had enough. And so he just still feels, I'm up against this. I'm going to fight these people. And what were we thinking to release them? And so, of course, this is the interaction that Moses has with the people of God. And he said, in the morning, God looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud on the Egyptian army and threw them into, pa into a panic. He clogged the wheels of their chariots and they were stuck in the mud. Isn't that an amazing script? That's been my prayer. And so I want to end off by simply saying there are two prayers that I'm praying right now. And I'm praying for those who are in authority or places of influence that are appearing delinquent. This is my prayer. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 10, I want you to go there in the message, all right? So rebel kings, use your heads. Upstart judges, learn your lesson. Worship God in adoring embrace. Celebrate in trembling awe. Kiss the Messiah. Your very lives are in danger, you know. His angel is about to explode, but you make a run for God and you won't regret it. That's a very redemptive prayer. It's simply praying, God, will you change the hearts of those who are in management, those who are in influence, who have positions of influence and power to rally support. We're asking you to change their hearts and let them turn to you. That's a redemptive prayer to pray, people. That's a prayer that comes with love in our hearts because we don't want to see the death and the destruction. And in actual fact, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. They put themselves in the front line of death row. And so what we've got to do is we've got to pray for our leaders. And so pray this prayer. Pray that they would turn their hearts. And then pray Exodus chapter 14, verse 25. Pray this. COVID, with all of its variances, like Pharaoh doing the church harm and wanting to oppress her, pray this. It was now the morning watch. God looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud on the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He clogged the wheels of their chariots and they were stuck in the mud. The mud. There was no more momentum. They knew. In fact, you read about that. They realized, oh, this is, this is the, the Israeli God that we're up against. And so that's what we're asking for right now. We need to be praying these prayers. Pray that prayer. God, let their wheels get stuck in the mud. You can pray that even for those in influence. But that's been my prayer. So those two things. It's the Exodus 14.25 and Psalm 2 verse 10. Let's be praying those prayers as we go into the season of warfare. Church, let's rally. Let's be praying. Let's be like Daniel in our individual capacity. Yes, there will be another time where as a congregation we will gather to pray. And maybe to spend some time in fasting as well. But that's what's required for right now as we're in the season. None of us have experienced a season such as what we have right now. It's unprecedented. And that means it requires an unprecedented response of you and I just praying the way that we should. I um, have a quote, and I wish I knew who said this, and I'll close with it. It says, a person who regularly stands before God on behalf of other people will be enabled to stand before other people on behalf of God. Now, I want that just to stay up on the screen just for a little while. A person who regularly stands before God on behalf of other people, that's us. When we stand before God on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our leaders, on behalf of people who have not been well, who have succumbed to COVID, all right, those same people who stand will be enabled to stand before other people on behalf of God. You see, God's going to raise us up. He's going to raise up Christian, Christian leaders in politics where their view will be a biblical view and it will change the heart of the politicians. That's what we need to be praying for. Then the place will be shaken. But church, let's be encouraged. We are not on the losing side. Not at all. In this life, we'll have trials and tribulation. We're having an unprecedented trial and tribulation in our nation right now. But we've got to stand our ground because I tell you, God is angry. God is angry. And all we have to do is just align ourselves with him and let him, let him be merciful to those he chooses to be merciful and let him make judgment calls where they're, we don't need to make the judgment call. No, no, no. We pray for righteousness. That's our mandate. God bless you. I'm going to pray for you right now. Could we do that? Father, we stand before you. And we just admire people like Daniel. We admire people like Paul, who actually lived out a revelation continually. Paul knew that there was spiritual darkness. He knew that there were forces that were in control. He knew that those are the very things that would take and occupy the minds of people who were in influence. And he knew what they were capable of doing. 
And now what we see is Daniel prays. Immediately there's a response from heaven. God, let us be encouraged that immediately you respond when we pray. And so, Father, we, we say in the name of Jesus, we declare peace in South Africa, political peace. We declare God righteous rulers for our nation. We declare that as we have righteous rulers in our nation, God-fearing rulers, God-trembling-fearing rulers, that, God, we will see prosperity come. And it won't take forever, but rather we'll just see blessing come. God, let the church rise up. We as a church, can we not be have excuses for not praying at a time like this? But let us get dressed for battle right now. Every one of us. This is not a time for lazing, not a time to go and lie on the beach, uh, proverbially speaking. This is a time for us in our hearts to make an attitude change and to say, you know what? We're going to engage God in a fight for our nation and its health and its well-being. We want to see thousands, millions of South Africans come to know Jesus. And that's the prayer of our heart. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. It's good to be back in South Africa. I want to tell you, um, this is still a great place to be as a church. We have relevance. God bless you.